Let's go. Okay. Okay, and now, welcome, Dan Wally! <laughs> it's good you just did that, because guess what I just realized? I'm like, shoot, I didn't plug in my power. So hold on, let's plug that in and we'll get going. That was, um, I don't think you can have a better intro than Shy, because he's just awesome. All right. All right, there we go. Yeah, the screen went dim and I went, that's not a good sign. Um, so my name's Dan Walleen. Thanks for coming. Um, with Shy, everybody hopefully just woke up there. Um, I listened to a little Ramstein on the way over, so I'm actually kind of pumped up. That's, that's like uh, probably 10 cups of coffee or something, right? A little Ramstein live. Um, so uh, I run a consulting company called Wally Consulting and work a lot with some of the stuff we're going to be talking about. So we're going to focus uh, on containers. And yesterday, some of you probably saw five minutes um, of containers. And probably everybody's like, yeah, I got it. Everybody got it? <laughs> How many are actually using containers? OK. You just downloaded it? Good job. Um, so uh, let me tell you a little story first on how I got into it. And uh, then we'll, we'll jump on in here. So when, uh, when I switched to, I switched to WordPress a while back, and I'm not a PHP guy, uh, but there was a particular plugin I wanted to use, and so I went ahead and used it. And uh, I was using a hosted version of it, and if anybody's ever had the fun experience of you go ahead and just update production directly, right? And uh, for whatever reason, the new plugin I wanted to use bombed production. And of course, I didn't have another way to recover this. And so it was a little mini one of those, oh my gosh, what have I done? You know? And so I went, OK, I, I can't do it this way. I didn't do that for anything else, just, just the blog, um, but you know, because it was hosted. So I had heard about Docker, and this is, this is probably about three and a half, almost four years ago, but I hadn't really done anything. So I said, you know, let's see how this goes. And I ended up getting WordPress. It took me, I won't say I did it in a couple hours. I, I spent a, a bit of time because I was learning everything, you know, learning curve, and was able to get it 100% with, I used uh, MariaDB, uh, MySQL, locally on my machine, so that I could run the exact same setup as what would be up in the cloud, um, because I hosted this up on uh, Azure. So that really piqued my interest, because I'm like, oh my gosh, I can run the exact same setup, make changes, deploy these con uh, images that we're going to talk about to production, and boom. And guess what's, uh, it, there's a good end to this story. I have never once, knock on wood somewhere, uh, had a problem again with updating something because, of course, I always do like we should. I'm able to update it locally, try it out, and then I can push uh, to the cloud. So we're going to be talking about uh, not only Angular, but is anybody doing microservices at all? Okay, actually quite a bit. Is anybody doing microservices right? <laughs> it's a very, subject very subjective comment. So. Um, all the content's going to be here. Hopefully, you've had time to check this out. Uh, it's up on Google Slides, so you'll be able to get to it at any point. So let's jump on in here. So the agenda, we're going to talk first off kind of why containers. I gave that little story, but I'll give you a little more here. Um, from there, we're going to go into, so what exactly are containers and images, and how does it work? What are some of the commands you might want to know? Um, I'll run a few demos as we go along with that. And then we're going to jump into some scenarios. Uh, ng-serve is awesome. I mean, anytime I can use ng-serve and call into like a RESTful API and not even have to bring that up at all, just run ng-serve and be like, I'm happy, then I like that. But uh, before we do move between environments, staging, production, whatever it may be, it is kind of nice to make sure it actually works the same, right? So we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, we're also going to go into what if you want to just automate your build process? Um, with containers. You could do that. And it's actually very cool. It's very easy to get going, too. To talk about the whole concept of Angular calling services. All right, so some of you are probably lucky enough, you just focus on the Angular. 
But I suspect there's a fair number in here that you're also building out some of the back-end services. And as you know, that's where it gets a little tricky, right? Because it's like the Angular app's working great, but how do I get my exact environment up and running locally or even on a dev environment? And then ensure that it actually works in staging and production and stuff like that. So we'll talk about that. And then just a real quick section at the end on uh, deploying. Like, what if you did want to go to the cloud or something? You know, how hard would it be? And we'll talk real quick about that. So why containers? Um, I asked that question myself because I'm one of those that when a new tech comes out that has all the hype, uh, if you have any non-technical management, as an example, and they went to like a CIO conference and somebody told them it was a good idea to do containers, they have no idea why, of course. Um, and then they came back and said, let there be containers, right? And then you're like, do we need this? <laughs> And I'm always one of those that write tool for the right job. I'm not going to say that containers are appropriate for every single scenario, but I'll be honest, everything we do now, uh, a lot of our clients, they're using containers. And so we'll talk about that. So why? Well, back in the day, this dates me a little bit, but uh, I got one of these bad boys here for uh, Christmas. And the deployment mechanism was pretty phenomenal. It was this. My favorite part of this is it's a mini disk, right? They had bigger ones than this for those that have seen those. You know, and then as the web progressed, uh, things like Mosaic came out. This is actually uh, one of the first browsers I ever got to use when I was in college. And uh, it was pretty easy to deploy and to write because all there really was was HTML at that point. Um, this was a pretty awesome uh, retro editor here called Hot Dog Pro. I don't know if anyone remembers this. Yeah, and I look at it now and I go, holy, like, battleship gray. You know, it's like there's some serious design decisions there. Uh, but anyway, and then, you know, we'd use things like this. And I'm sure some of you still have deployment processes that are kind of like, yeah, just load up the files over here, point to the server over here, and hit a button, and hope the server version hasn't changed, and things like that, and patches and environment variables are all there. All right, now I showed this yesterday. This is kind of how it sort of feels for a lot of people. Um, this is how my WordPress process was. Not the fault of WordPress, <laughs> my fault. And uh, that's kind of, you know, it, it, things tend to sync a little more uh, when we don't have a more either automated process or even if it is automated. How many have ever had it where somebody updated the staging server, uh, the version, or even patched it Next thing you know, for whatever reason, your build stopped working, your app stops, and you're just like, what the, you know, and you can't figure it out. Well, this is the problem. So yesterday, I also showed this, that we can use these containers to not only ship our code, but also ship the exact server. I literally could run different versions of a framework on the same VM, no big deal, because I can containerize them. Uh, all my environment variables can go in here. Any security settings. Everything unique to that part of the app can go in the container. Now, I showed you could also have services, and you know, who knows? Could be Java, could be .NET, could be uh, PHP, Python, whatever it may be. All right, so how does Docker help? Well, really, it provides a shipping and building and kind of way to run your app there. And it runs natively uh, on Linux. That's where it kind of came out of. They have this LXE technology. And then when Docker came out, Docker's not the only option, but that's the one I've used. So that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, but it also runs on Windows Server, so you can do Windows containers as well. We'll get into that a little bit with mostly Linux, though, today. Uh, now, to get it going, you need to install Docker Community Edition. Uh, very quick install, and you'll be kind of ready to go. That's going to put a really small Alpine Linux uh, install. And if you're on Mac, you'll have a kind of hypervisor and hyper-V if you're on Windows. All right, and that's kind of how it works. And then we're going to talk about these images and containers. So the way this works, if you haven't done it, is there's a lot of containers that are already out there. Um, so I'm going to show what I, sh a real quick, yesterday I showed it really fast because I had like five minutes, but uh, I'll show a little bit more now on one called Nginx as an example. Uh, it could be Apache though. And this would be something to host our dist folder from Angular. Got to pick something, right? 
So what you'll do is you'll either use an existing image or oftentimes you'll tweak the existing image. Like they'll give you the kind of bottom of the cake and then you'll be like, nah, you know, I think we want our cake to be this tall and you'll add additional layers. These are instructions uh, you're gonna see in a moment. And what these instructions will do is say, when the container does run, here's what to do. Now, what's different when we run the container here is I'm not firing up a new VM. So I'm not making a new copy of the OS. I'm not making a new copy of the memory. I could have many containers on the same exact uh, VM, just in case you're new to this. So an image is really a read-only template. All right, this is something we're gonna be looking at here. Whereas a container is like taking that template and then uh, the way I explain is you have that layered cake and you add a little bit of frosting on top. And it's this readable, writable layer, they call it. But the way it works is somebody writes a Docker file, which we're gonna be talking about in a little more detail today. And then we're gonna run it through a build process. So you might write a Docker file here for say, uh, Nginx as an example. And then in that Docker file, you might say, hey, copy in the dist folder into this uh, image that we're gonna make. And then when that runs, it's like a shipping container. You know, think of the, the ship I showed earlier, and that's gonna ship it over to whatever environment you want. And it's pretty easy to do if you haven't done it. So we'll create a Docker image out of that. Now, of course, the image then, we have to push it somewhere. We'll talk about that a little bit later here. So here's kind of the steps then, if you're really new to this. Number one, you have to install Docker CE, as I already mentioned. Optionally, create a Docker file. Now, I could run Angular uh, with just the Nginx image that Nginx actually provides. The problem will be out of the box, like if somebody refreshes, if you have a, a Angular route up in the URL, Nginx, you need to put a little redirect in there. Otherwise, it's gonna try to go to a server-side route. You know, it doesn't work, you get a 404. So while they're kind of stock image does work, you're gonna find that you'll at least wanna copy a configuration file, if it was like Nginx, HA proxy, whatever it may be, into the image and the container uh, so that you can handle this redirect for Angular. So we'll kind of talk about that coming up. And then from there, you just run some Docker commands or there's even, if you have uh, VS Code or even some other tools, there's a Docker extension, which I'll show you a little bit of that today, and it's pretty awesome. Um, you can literally right click and go, you know, look mom, no command line. And it can just push and build and run and all kinds of fun stuff. All right, so here's kind of one of the, the first little things you can do. If I wanted to run um, with Nginx, and again, this is certainly not the only option, then I could uh, pull this down if I had Docker CE installed. And what this would do is pull this kind of layered file system down get it on my laptop, for example, and then we're pretty much ready to go. Now, to run it, we can go in and do something like this. Now, what this is doing here is saying, hey, Docker, I want to run Nginx Alpine, a very small Linux image. The dash D is I want to run it in detached mode. By default, when you kind of hit enter, if you don't do dash D, it'll lock up your console, and then you know, you'd have to like control C or something to get out. Command, uh, no, control. And it uh, depends on your operating system. The dash P is, if we're gonna call this, what are we calling it on? What's the port? So we're gonna say externally it's gonna be 8080. Now probably this will be 80. It'd be 80 or 8080 in this example, and then we're gonna forward it to 80, which is the internal. So the way I envision this, I'm a very visual thinker. Think of a container up here on the stage, and on the outside of the container there's like a phone hanging on the, the wall. And the number to call to that phone is 8080. But then when you call, there's a line that goes inside of, now I'm stepping inside of the container, and that is 80. So they're kind of forwarding the call to another number. So external port, internal port. And that kind of shows right here, and then that's your uh, image that you want to pull. All right, so pretty easy. You're just setting up some ports that uh, you want to run here. So uh, this one, I demoed this yesterday, but let me go ahead and uh, we'll take a little more time on this. So on this, let me actually just open up a command here. And first off, I'm just gonna do Docker and you can do like help. And then before you all leave today, I need you to memorize this, so. 
get on it. It's actually not that bad. Honestly, it's not. There's, there's a handful of these I actually use every day, and then there's most of them I have to go look up. <laughs> I don't use them that much. All right, so we could do this. Docker pull, Nginx, Alpine. Now, real quick, where's it pulling from? Well, by default, it's pulling from, uh, it's called hub.docker.com, uh, Docker Hub. And Docker Hub is where they host all the images, but if you had an internal repository in your company, then you could host it there. Uh, you could host on AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, whatever. They all have repository options so that you can uh, host these. So I would do poll, and I'm going to go ahead and assume it probably hasn't changed much. Yeah, and it hasn't since I ran it about two hours ago. And so now, what it would do normally is, you, you know, there'll be a little pause while it downloads it, and then you would have it. Okay, so now to run it, we can do run, and then if I want to detach it, we say dash D, give it the port, we'll do the 8080 to 80 here, and then Nginx Alpine, enter. All right, now that's the detach. See how the console came back, and now I can do something, and I don't kind of kill it by doing control C. All right, so now if I do docker ps, well, I can just do that. It'll show me, but normally I do, if you want to see all your containers, you do docker ps a. All right, so they gave it this lovely Gallant Goodall alias. You could use that, but you'll see on the left, 522E12, see that up there? That's the container ID. So if I want to stop the container, I could say docker stop. And then you can just take, because I only have a f one container, hit, you can just take like the beginning of it, and I could stop it. But let's, uh, before I stop it, let's go ahead and let it run. And let's come back. Let me get into a, another browser here. And we'll do localhost 8080. And there we go. So that's Nginx, and it's, it literally is that easy. Now, you might go, I don't know Nginx. That's what's so cool about this. <laughs> um, now, I'm, I'm not going to advise you use a server you know nothing about, of course. You know, hey, let's use this. I know nothing about it. Um, but really, all that would be involved after this is there's going to be a config file you'll want to you'll copy into your container. You might have some SSL certificates. This typically will sit on the front of your app. But again, it's not the only option. HAProxy is another good one for this, but it's called a reverse proxy. What it'll do is it'll handle static files. Any dynamic request that it can't handle, it'll forward to what's called an upstream node, like Node.js or .NET or Java or something like that. All right, pretty cool. So if we go back to here, that's working. But let's say, all right, I'm, I'm done with it. So Docker stop, and then 522, enter. Now, if I do Docker PS, see how nothing's showing? Because the container's not running. So let's do Docker PS-A. And now there it is, but notice uh, it kind of wraps. But over here on the right, it says exited eight seconds ago. OK, so the container, I can remove it by saying Docker RM 522. And now let's clear that. Docker PS A, boom, all gone. Pretty cool. Now, here's what's really cool, though. How many have installed uh, something, e even, with, if you, even if you have a Mac with like Brew or Chocolatey or something like that you know, on one of your systems? and you uninstall it, but it leaves stuff behind, right? Well, I need this image, so I'm not going to do this, but if I go to Docker Images, let's find this guy right there. Third one down. Oop, let me go back. All right, third one down. Let's scroll over to the, the right here. 18 meg. That's how big the image is, so pretty dang small. And now I could do this. Well, let me, I didn't grab the ID, did I? So if, we, if you look there, third one down, looks like EBE2 or something like that. OK, so let's go ahead now. And I could say Docker remove image RMI, and I could do EBE2. I'm not going to do that because I need it for later demos. It would literally be as if I never had that on my system now. There will be zero junk left behind. That's one of my favorite features right there, because you know how that is where you get all those junk folders and config files. All right, so that's kind of the real basics. So now, as a review, nothing's now running at all. And this will be a little more obvious, because if I refresh, yeah, looks like it's now uh, down. There's no web server. Now, let's imagine, which I'm going to do in a moment, that we actually put Angular into this. Now we could have Angular serving this up. Or, I'm sorry, Nginx serving up Angular. 
All right, so moving on here, let's continue onward and upward. So how would you run Angular then on a real server? Like you've done ng-serve, which I love, and then you're like, hey, it works, I'm good to go, but I actually want to run it for real on whatever your choice is. Okay, now when it comes to servers, um, you know, there's no shortage, but we definitely can't use that. Now, I left this in here. Has anyone ever typed ng-server? Is anyone like me, for whatever reason, you cannot type serve? That works. Has anyone ever noticed this? <laughs> I don't know how long it'll, it'll keep working, but ng-server actually works. I just wanted to show you that. Um, because it, it looks like, whoa, you got a typo. Yeah, technically it is a typo, but it works. So I'm hoping that they keep that because I don't know, I have like a mental block or something. I just can't type serve. Uh, so how are you running your Angular in production? Some of you are probably using Apache, uh, maybe IIS, uh, maybe Nginx, HAProxy, uh, Tomcat, Node, you know, who knows. Um, but are you able to do it in a way that's always the same? So in other words, if I move between my environments, how confident are you that nobody screwed up your version, your patches, your environment variables, whatever you're using? And for some of you, you're like, yeah, we're pretty confident. And some of you are going, yeah, last night I got a call actually, and you know, I had to fix this. So there's a lot of server options. I'm just gonna quickly go you know, through this. You've all seen these types of things, and there's many, many options. Um, again, my preference is Nginx just because it's a very fast uh, reverse proxy static file type server. So what if we want to get Angular running? Well, one way to do this is we make a custom Docker file. And what we do with the Docker file then is we, in the Docker file instructions, we copy in the dist folder into the image. That adds it to this chocolate cake. So imagine at the top of the chocolate cake layer, that's my code. But everything under is like the Nginx instructions and, and you know, environment variables, stuff like that I might need. Okay, and then we build it to make an image. Now we take the image and then we're gonna run it. Now here's the deal though, how fun is that where you just did a new ng build and a new dist folder gets created and then you go, wait a sec, my container already has the old code, so you're so seriously? I gotta like rerun and rebuild the container. I mean, that, that would get old really fast. Right? You don't want to build and then rebuild the container and then run it. And so what we can do locally, in this example anyway, is we can do the same thing I showed earlier here, but see that dash V. Now I mentioned this for about probably five seconds yesterday in the short talk, but let's go through this real quick. This sets up what's called a volume, and you can also do other things. There's another one called a, a binding a bind mount. But a volume, what it's doing is this folder on the right, USR share Nginx HTML, that's by default the folder that Nginx, or let's say it's your server, let's say you're using Apache, and whatever folder is the default where your Angular code goes, all right, that would be that folder on the right. Okay, that's the default for Nginx. Now, the one on the left of the colon there, that's my dist folder. Now, what's up with the $PWD for those that haven't seen that? Well, that's my working directory. In other words, if I'm running this from a specific directory, I want to link from the container back to my local hard drive. Now, if I do an ng build, guess what happens? It's almost like I, you know, imagine a big container again up here on stage. It's almost like I punched a hole in the container and put a little, I don't know, a hose or something that connects inside of the container out to your local hard drive. All right, and that's what you're doing. Now, a little word to the wise on this. Anyone know what happens every time you run ng build to the dist folder? It deletes it, yes. And guess what that does to your container volumes? It's like somebody goes in with uh, some cutters and chops that hose. <laughs> it breaks it. So has anyone ever used the uh, uh, delete output path? D it's dash D-O-P. Anyone ever seen this? I'm guessing some of you have, but probably a lot of you are going, nope, never heard of that one. So when you do, uh, I won't run it because I'm not in the right folder, but if I do an ng build, there's a dash DOP, delete output path, false. Now what that'll do is now when we build, instead of deleting the dist folder every time, it'll keep it so now my volume doesn't break, my connection to the container doesn't break, and then every time we build, it just updates the files instead of uh, deleting the folder. If you don't know that one, 
and I might have not known that one when I first started this, <laughs> then uh, there you go. That's what you would kind of do. And now I'll show you a little demo of this in, in just a sec here. So in fact, let's do that right now. So let's come on in. I have a really simple project I showed yesterday. This is just a, kind of a really basic CLI project. But let's say I want to kind of containerize this. We'll get back to this guy in just a sec. So let me go a little up there, all right. And uh, to run this, what do we do? Well, you're all experts at this now. We could say docker run, all right? So docker run dash d dash p. Um, I don't know, we could do 80 this time if you want, 80 forwards to 80. And then you have this lovely syntax here. So um, we want to go from dollar pwd. Now this depends, uh, in fact, I have a blog post on this if you want it. Depends on like what version of Windows you're running. Are you on Mac? On what you use here can depend on your OS, just as a heads up. This is what works great on my Mac. Okay, and then we have the path I can never remember. So how about we just do this? Because I know you'd all love to see me uh, fail on the demo. Because let's face it, there's nothing more fun than that. You're like, how is he going to solve this one? <laughs> and then what do we do? Well, we say Nginx Alpine. All right, so let me zoom that really quick here. So same exact thing you saw on the slide. Well, it better be. Does anyone see any typos there? Yeah. I'm counting on you. Do you? <laughs> Which one? Alpine. Sorry, one more time. Alpine. Alpine. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, it might be wrapping. It's wrapping. We're good, but good catch. Good catch. So, all right. Uh, yeah, it's like Alpine. So now I'm going to hit enter um, here. Now, what this is going to do is, let me do an ls, and we'll see all our folders. And notice I have, kind of on the bottom left there, a dist folder, right? Now, so I've already built. Now, just as a heads up, though, if you build again, you're going to wreck your whole volume here. It's going to break that hose connection from the container. So I'm not going to do that. We're going to assume it's OK. So now that I have that, I literally have Nginx running. Let's go now. I think we ran it on 80, right? OK, that's cached, actually. Got to love cache. That'll be a microservice one I'm going to run at the end. And uh, uh oh, uh oh, what did I do? What did I do? Oh, yeah, thank you, thank you. The problem, yes, thank you, the customers. Now, here's this, I didn't mean to show this. Well, actually, you know what? I meant to show this to illustrate a point. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for catching that. What's happening here is, remember, I used the default Nginx um, container in image. Well, they don't know about server-side routes at all, so it's just going, I don't know what to do. Now, if this one doesn't work, I got another problem. But, uh, and it's not working. Are you kidding me? Yeah, let's go see what's going on here. All right, so now we debug, and if it's not a quick one, I'll show you a better demo anyway. But let me uh, CD into the dist. Let me do an LS. Ah. Minor detail, my dist is empty. <laughs> so, OK, now, so here's what we're going to have to do. This will be a little debug exercise, live. You've got to love it. Um, if I do docker ps-a, there's my container, 4.5d. So first off, how do I stop it? Just yell it out. Oh, yeah, there you go. Let's, it, Eric, you're genius. I know Eric from another thing we did. But yeah, let's go back up. Yeah, let's do docker build dash dop delete output path, false. Now we're going to hope, because I haven't actually tried doing this backwards like I'm doing right now, but we're going to hope that uh, it builds this up and we get our code here. So why did we get that forbidden? Well, because it went, I don't even see anything I can run <laughs> in here. And so it kind of aired out. All right, so now let me just CD into dist and uh, let's ls. All right, that looks a little better maybe, huh? Okay. Now, hopefully that left the folder alone. If not, I am going to have to come back and stop it and restart it. But there it is. It still says it's running. Notice up on the top right, 80 forwards to 80. See that right there? Perfect. That's what I want. So now let's come back to localhost. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Give uh, Eric a applause for his thoughts. <laughs> What's that? Oh, oh geez. And I've been calling Eric, Eric, and Eric is actually Chris. Uh, sorry, there's another guy named Eric I just talked to. So Kyle is still Kyle, right? I know some of these guys on the front row. All right. 
Well, that'll be forever ingrained in video, so uh, <laughs> you're, you're now famous, Eric Chris. <laughs> All right, now this is just a really simple app, um, nothing real fancy here, but this is running in uh, the actual container. Now, I don't have time to change anything here because we've got a bunch more I want to cover. This is just the basics. But if I were to change this and rebuild with that DOP option, false, what's going to happen when I refresh? Boom, I pick up the changes, but this is Nginx, this is not ng-serve, obviously. Okay, so that's kind of cool. Um, so let's go in and let's stop this guy because I'm going to need that port a little bit later. So I'm going to stop 4.5D. All right, perfect. Now, as a heads up, the volumes kind of stick around. So when you do like a stop and a remove, you can actually say remove the volumes. I'm not going to show that, but you could. And we'll do docker remove rm 4.5D. All right, and anytime uh, you see the ID kind of echoed back, you're like, that's a good thing. So, okay. So that's kind of stage one, is you can run your local code in a container. And by the way, this works for Java, this works for Node, this works for .NET, this works for everything. This isn't just for Angular. Um, it's pretty cool. So let's go on back, continue onward and upward here. So that's kind of the uh, fundamentals of getting started with this. Now, remember how uh, whoever caught the slash customers, good, oh, well, it was Chris, um, you know, good job there. Because what happened was I didn't have this config file copied in. If I did this, this is how we could copy the code in, but even doing that isn't going to help us when they have like a route, you know, any Angular route. And the reason for that is, again, the server gets it first, and how many have had to program your backend to automatically redirect back to your like index HTML? Pretty normal, right? So I'll show you an example here in a moment of how we do that. But this is an example of a Docker file from Nginx Alpine. And a little hint here, I didn't put a version, so anyone know what it grabs? Latest. That's a great idea, right? <laughs> Probably not. So you can put a colon there after the Alpine, and you could say, like, I don't even know what the latest version is, but let's say it was 1.0. You could put 1.0.0 or something like that, just as a heads up. Uh, you always have to put who to blame. So that, that's a required one. No, it's not required, but you should put it. And then what we're doing here is now I don't want to run the container and have that hose going out to my local code. I actually want to copy the dist folder into uh, this USR share Nginx HTML. Now, if I were to build this, which I'm going to show you that process in a moment here, then I could push this up to Docker Hub, you could pull it down, and literally within as fast as the network was to pull it down, you could be running the exact same app with Nginx on your laptop. Pretty cool. Now, here's how you build. So the way this works is you're going to set up a repository. So mine is just Dan Walling up on uh, Docker Hub or AWS or Azure or whatever it may be. You're then going to uh, name the image that you want to make. In this case, I just called it ng-app. And you're going to give it a tag. You don't have to tag it, but you should uh, with a version. Because then you can actually, you literally could run version 1, version 1.1, version 1.2 at the same time. I don't know why you would, but you could. Um, in production, which is actually kind of cool. Or you can roll back easier as well. Okay, then to run it, we do the exact same thing, but no volume this time, because the code is in the container now, as we copied it. And now I have my same exact thing I'm running with that tag there. All right, now one thing I didn't mention, see that dot on the very end of this build? That's where does it look for the Docker file? So I'm saying look in the local folder where I'm running this command. That's what the dot means. It's the context, they call it. All right, so how do we do that? Well, so you could type this if you wanted. And you just saw that. But you know, you, don't, you really don't have to type it. So if I go to my extensions in uh, VS Code here, see if I can shrink this down a little bit. Somewhere down in here, there we go. I have the Docker extension for VS Code. This is like the coolest thing pretty much since sliced bread. Uh, because if you don't want to type all that and remember and you know, for all your builds and your runs and everything, this will actually let you do it very easy. So let me show you here. I have two Docker files. Here's the one that you just saw that doesn't copy in the code. 
but it does copy a configuration file. Now this config I'm copying in, this handles the redirect and a few other things like caching headers and stuff like that. Okay, so I'm just copying a config file from a local folder into this Nginx location. Now again, ignore that part if you don't run Nginx, it would be, you know, copy your config obviously into your folder. Now when I do that though, I'm not copying the code. So now I'd have to set up a volume, right? Um, but let's say we wanted to do that. We want to run this custom image, so at least the redirects would work, and we set up the volume. How would I build this? Well, the normal way is it's called job security. You type it, and then you got to remember, like, shoot, what was the command, and how do I do it? Or you could do this. Okay, first off, I can uh, get into the palette here of uh, commands, um, shift command or shift control P, and I can just type Docker. Now, this is all the stuff you can do here. I don't know if the back row can see that. So let me zoom that just a little bit. But I don't know. That might look interesting. And look what it does. It says, oh, hey, Dan, you have two Docker files. Which one do you want to build? And then I simply pick that. And then here's the tag. Now, latest, maybe or maybe not, is a good idea. Normally, I like to tag it with a version. Um, and then I would simply hit Enter. Okay, now I already have an image for this, so I'm not going to mess it up. I'm not going to be that risky today. Um, but that's how easy it would be. Now, obviously, I'm going to show you another one here, which is this guy in just a little bit. This is called a multi-stage Docker file. And I could do the same thing. Shift, Command, P, go to Docker, build image, and I could pick the prod version. Now, this one actually copies the code in. All right, pretty cool. So we're going to get back to this one in just a sec here. But that's how easy it would be. Um, we, we ran Angular, but also to kind of build a custom image that would handle things. So let's talk more about this whole build process then. What if, what if you just want to set up a CICD type process that actually uses containers? Because if you do it like most people do it, somebody has an actual server that has whatever your build, well, in this case, it'd be Node, obviously, for Angular. And it turns out somebody updated, they thought it was a great idea to go to 9.x, and it turns out we'll pretend that 9.x broke something. I'm not saying it would, but it happens. And how many have this problem right now where your environments, somebody else controls it, and they update it, and next, thing, next morning you're like, why did the build process stop? And then, oh, Chris messed it up. Yeah. So, uh, well, no, we probably should say Eric messed it up. <laughs> that's right, that's right. So, um, we can actually use containers for any build process. We could even use containers for testing processes, which is very, very cool, because what do you do with your, when you're done with the containers? Delete them. No big deal. In fact, you could fire up all kinds of containers. Once you're done, delete them. No harm, no foul. You could even run different versions if you wanted. You know, maybe on Sundays you like to just experiment. Whereas on Tuesdays, you like to do something else. I don't know. All right, so what they have in Docker is a, this is a newer concept. It's very cool, though. It's called multi-stage Docker files. It's the same thing we saw before. What you're going to do, though, is in the Docker file, you'll actually have multiple uh, images that get built and containers that actually run. So the way it works is you could have a node image that actually does the build. But then the output from that, which would be the dist folder, could then be copied over to like an Nginx or an HAProxy or whatever you guys like to use for your actual runtime production or staging container. Very cool. So the way this works is actually pretty easy. Now, if you're new to these, honestly, this is stuff, this project, in fact, I'll have a link to it. And there's a little bit I would change here. I tried to simplify it a little bit. But here's kind of what we can do. This is going to go grab the latest node. Now, again, I kept it simple just because versions change a lot. Um, you probably want to put like 8. Dot, what, what is the latest? 8.11 something for node um, here. So instead of latest, you can actually put 8.11. You know, like zero or something. But I'm going to go ahead and leave it. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a working directory in the container. I'm going to call it app. You can call it whatever you want. Okay, I'm going to copy the local code, which is pretty much everything you see over here, into this dot here is really like doing slash app. Just didn't want to repeat it. I'm going to run npm install. 
Okay, now I hard coded prod here, as you can see the, for the environment. You can uh, pass in variables though, build arguments they call them, so that you can make this dynamic. So for staging, you could pass in an argument for staging or dev or prod or whatever it is. Bottom line, we get a dist folder. Now that's only in that one container, but see how I aliased it right here as node? Well now notice stage two is I'm gonna say, all right, let's now make another image for Linux, okay, Alpine and Nginx. Uh, I'm gonna set up a volume. This is just for some caching uh, for runtime, ignore that one. But see the copy right there? See that from node? Well, node is the same as this guy. It's like an alias. So now I'm gonna say, hey, copy from app dist into, and then you've already seen this folder. So really what we're doing then is we have a bigger container that does the build process, because this one will be way bigger, this top one. But the output of that then gets copied into this bottom container. How cool is that? I think it's cool. Um, and then we copy in the config file here. Okay, and you can see it's just not that much code. Now you'll probably tweak this. In fact, I can guarantee you will, but at least it will give you a starting point um, for learning this. Now, how would we build then? Well, we, again, the easiest way is do this. You know, I've already selected this uh, Docker build right here, and you've already seen that I can do this. Now, again, I've already built this one, so I'm gonna leave it. But uh, let me show you the final version of what this generates. So down in the bottom of VS Code, I have this little Docker thing. This is my Docker extension. And if we open this, it is awesome sauce. Okay, you'll notice here's all my images. Very cool, in fact, I can even right click and if I wanna push this image up to my repository, I can do that just right click. Not bad. I can remove it, I can run it, I can run it interactive, I can tag it. Maybe I didn't name it right. Maybe I didn't uh, give it the right version. This is pretty cool, this just pops up a little dialogue and then you just change it, it'll re-tag it. Re-give it a different version for example. So now, if we wanted to run uh, one of these versions, these two are the same. One is for Docker Hub, no, that's my Docker Hub ID. This was one I just built locally. But I could just right click and run it, you've already seen this, so I'm gonna skip this part. And then we would be off and running, but the code is now in the container. All right, this is the Nginx uh, that would actually run. Very, very cool. Or I can even do it up here, we could say, um, you know, go into the Shift Command P, do Docker run, and then you can pick which image to run um, there. I'm not gonna run that in the interest of time. Okay, that's pretty cool. And keep in mind, again, we're focused on Angular. You can do this with anything. You could build your Java apps, your .NET apps, your uh, whatever apps, Python, you name it. You could do this process. Now, the next thing that I like about this is uh, if you're only working on the Angular part of the app, which some of you probably are, then I'd say more power to you. <laughs> it's less headache. But how many are actually working on not only the Angular app, but some back-end services as well? I'm guessing most of it, yeah, a lot of you. So you're kind of doing the full stack you know, development. Well, how do you get an entire environment up and running to test it out as if it was real? What's that? Pray, okay, that's a valid uh, option there. It's like, please work. Um, what happens when tomorrow they decide for production that a new version of the server for one of these services is gonna be used? And if you've installed that service locally, like installed it for real, what's the fun there? I think we all know the answer. You hope that you can easily upgrade to the next version, right? Well, with containers and images, we don't care. I can easily change to the latest image. Maybe a DevOps team actually provides the base image that we use, and then I just work with that and we're good to go. So for this, I showed this yesterday, but I showed it in probably about two seconds. Um, we might have, you know, we'll, we'll say these are microservices, right, behind the scenes, um, where actually each microservice has its own database, kind of a true microservice architecture. And we might have a mobile app and our Angular app and web apps and all that calling into this. And that's only what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, assuming your databases were also containers, which they could be, by the way. Plus some over here, plus you probably have a gateway. And I mean, but we're up to over 10 already. Yeah, good luck getting that going locally where it runs like staging and production, right? You can do it, but man, is it painful. So. 
for those new to microservices, the idea is it's kind of like a car these days where, you know, can you imagine if they actually welded the wipers on and every time you got to change them, you have to get out the torch? <laughs> That'd be bad. We want to be able to swap out things. So with microservices, it's kind of like this idea where every little part of the app, sometimes people go really small, really granular, could be a microservice. Now, this isn't a microservices talk, but some of you are doing it, I know, so I just wanted to kind of point this out. Now, whether you're doing microservice, this one's a little more traditional, where you just have a back-end database and maybe a Redis cache or something. You know, you have services somewhere, because we got to. And maybe they update the database, maybe they integrate with Redis. Um, you know, how easy is it to get all of those services running, not only on your laptop, but consistently across any server you have? How easy is it to move it to the cloud? if you're doing cloud. And I'm gonna argue not as easy as it could be if you're doing it manually. All right, so what do we do in this case though? Because you saw me have to do Docker run or have to right click on each container or image. That'd be painful, right? So we can orchestrate all this process here using something called Docker Compose, which I'm gonna kind of wrap up with here. And this would be for those of you that, you know, you're not just doing the Angular app, but you also have all these services and fun stuff that you want to do. So a Docker Compose file takes other images you have out there and is like the conductor of an orchestra, says, all right, image one, fire up, image two, fire up, and it orchestrates bringing up a whole bunch or even just maybe two uh, containers. And then you can run those images, convert them to running containers. Now, I'm just going to go through this part really quick. This is kind of what it looks like. So you have these services. This is a YAML file. Um, if you like spacing and stuff, you'll love YAML files. Um, if you don't, you won't like them, but they're not too bad. Nginx is going to be one of my services. OK, that's probably my Angular app right there. And I have an Nginx Docker file. All right, now it's in a network. You can actually create a network so components can talk to each other. Um, in the same network. That way, if I had a container, I said component. It's Angular this week, so excuse me. I, a container is what I meant to say. Um, if you have a container that's out there that uh, is not part of this app, I probably don't want to have it communicate with the others, so it would be in a different network. And there's all kinds of fun security things you can do. Now, here's a Postgres image. This one is using a custom Docker file when we build. This one is saying, just use the standard PostgreSQL image that's out there. And then we can create this thing called a network. Now, there's a lot more to this. We won't have time to go into it. But what you can do then is say, Docker Compose build in the location where that YAML file is. If you add 50 services, that automatically builds all those. So you don't have to do Docker build, Docker build, Docker build 50 times. You do this one command. It's awesome. Then how do I bring up all these containers? Well, I'm going to show you that next. Docker Compose up, okay? And then finally, you live long and prosper, and everybody's happy. So how do we uh, do this? Well, first thing I'm going to do, because yesterday I realized as I was doing my one talk, I went, oh, shoot, I didn't stop the, the uh, container. Okay, so notice, nothing up my sleeves here. Uh, nothing's running, it looks like, on the containers, so I'm not going to have a port 80 issue. Now, I'm going to go to a different project. Um, this is the YAML file. Now, there's quite a bit. Uh, there's, I believe, six containers in this one. Um, we have Nginx with Angular calling Node.js, calling, uh, we have ASP.NET Core, we have Postgres, Mongo, and this thing called C-Advisor. C-Advisor is a kind of easy way to monitor containers. So I've already done the build on this just to save time because the build, depending on what you're building, it can take a, a few minutes. Oh, thank you, Siri. No, not right now. We'll talk after. Um, so uh, I'm going to come in and do Docker Compose Build, and I would hit Enter. Now, I've already done that to save time, and I'm going to say Up. Now, what this does, oh, and by the way, I could have done this. If you do uh, come into here, you can also do some stuff in here with Docker Compose Up and Down. See that? Pretty cool. But I'm used to typing it. All right, now this is going to seed the database. It's actually working with some volumes pointing to my local code right now. So right now, I can change the Angular app, the .NET app, the Node app, uh, all that locally, and it will update in the containers because I have volumes. Now, this will take just a little bit more time, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap up with the final topic, and we're going to come back and try to run it, and we'll get you out of here. Because I am right now, it's 520, so. All right, so um, 
how do you deploy these between environments then? Uh, whether it's on site or you want to move them up to Docker Hub or Azure or AWS or whatever you use, you know, what would you do? Well, I won't have time to demo the whole concept because my time is out, but here's what you would do. You would push the image or images up to your repository. Now, those using a cloud repository, they'll have a specific uh, URL and login and stuff for you so that you can push those. Now, those that are, just want to go local, you can have a local repository for your images. That's what a lot of companies do that haven't moved to the cloud yet. And that way, it tracks all the versions and all that fun stuff. Now, once you push, you're ready to go. Now, I use Azure. That's just where I host all my stuff. This is an example of something called uh, Web App for Containers. Here's how easy it would be to get one of these uh, Angular containers going. So you would give the app a name. Uh, you create what's called a resource group, which is just a, a group to organize everything. It's like a bucket. And then in the configure container, I can point to ACR, I can point to a private registry, or I just did Docker Hub, and then this Dan Wallin ng app would be my image. And then, of course, if there was a version on that, which normally there is, you would say colon 1.0.0 or whatever. You would then hit that button, create down in the bottom, and give it about 45 to 60 seconds, and boom, that container would now be up in the cloud. Now, here's what's so cool about that. How reliant am I now on the cloud dictating the version? I am not. I control the version. I control everything about the process. So if you are a control freak, and let's face it, we all are um, in our world, <laughs> then this is pretty cool because you don't have to wait for your cloud provider or even, even your local DevOps, if you can get them to use containers, you don't have to wait for them to give you the proper version. All right, now, last thing I'm gonna show and then I'll uh, get off here so we can let the next folks come up is let's go back. I hope this worked. Let's see here. All right, perfect. So it looks like it inserted some sample data, um, and now it's listening. This is one of the microservices on port uh, 5000, but port 80 is my Nginx. All right, and there we go. So this is now the kind of microservice app. It's an Angular app in Nginx calling Node and .NET, calling different containerized databases. And, so we, and then we also even have well, here, I'll show you real quick. It, it does actually work. You can go in and do updates and deletes and all that fun stuff, as you can see there. This is another cool thing. When I'm done screwing up the database, I just bring down the containers it's as if it never happened in this case, because I'm not setting up volumes or anything. Now, I can also go in and go to port, uh, what is it, 8080, I believe. And this will actually now show me some stats on my cores that are being used, my memory, um, all kinds of fun stuff here for each of the containers. How cool is that? And that's just a free option. All right, so there's a lot more we could cover, but we're going to wrap up with that. So let me give you a, a little resource here if you're interested. Um, I run a bunch of Flipboard magazines, and one of them is on Docker and Kubernetes. We didn't have time to go into Kubernetes, but there you go. And then also there's an Angular one. So pretty much every time I find an awesome article, some of you have probably written some awesome articles that are in there, I suspect, that I put into here. So if you're interested, I mean, go to the link there. And then if you're interested, there's a newsletter as well. With that, thanks so much for your time. Here's the link where you can get all, uh, there's links at the end for all the code, everything I showed. And uh, thanks for coming. <clears throat>